Okay, so in the last video I mentioned I'd do a teardown of the sanctuary. Uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks, so I haven't gotten around to it. But I finally have it here ready to be torn down. But before we got into that, I figured I'd show off a little bit more of the keyboard and its special functions. Uh, primarily the magnets. Uh, I added that you could add magnets in the instructables, but I didn't really explain what it was for. So I have a little neodymium magnet here, and you can see there's one in each corner of the keyboard. And you can, it'll basically snap in and uh, snap onto the corners of the keyboard. And then there's two on this little uh, arrow rail here. And what that was for originally was a top case for the sanctuary. So I could put a case on it to transport. And originally that's where the name came from too. Was uh, I planned on having a top case named the fortress. And this was going to be the sanctuary. And together it would be the sanctuary fortress which is from a uh, area in Metroid Prime 2. Uh, but basically, uh, the rail came into that design too because Metroid Prime has magnetic morph ball rails. And uh, what that actually got ended up using for was this tiny little screen. So we have a little screen that's got a webcam, speakers, and a touch 1080p display. And it's basically just got your HDMI and USB inputs. Uh, but basically, what it does is it'll just sit on there and it'll let me use uh, it for different things like a Raspberry Pi or a my server a lot of the times since I still use a GUI, uh, I'm still learning. But uh, you can see it's a bit flimsy so you can't really touch it when it uh, is sitting on there. But uh, it's kind of a neat, nice thing to just have a place to set up this monitor and have it set in place. Uh, originally I was going to design a few more things for it, maybe like a phone stand but I never really got around to it. And again, I didn't really get around to the case. You can see the little back. I might do another video on that at one point, but we can take off the case now. So we have the left half and we have the right half. And I'll show with the right half, uh, we can see the magnets in there. They're glued in place. And this diffuser was originally an LED diffuser, uh, 3D printed with clear PETG. Uh, if it, uh, eventually I removed the LED strip there. Uh, it was causing too many troubles and I wasn't really wanting to troubleshoot it monthly. So I ended up just removing it and removing it from the design. But we have the keyboard here and I can take it out of the case now that the, I already unplugged the switch and button. So we have the design here. That's where the uh, LEDs and the magnets were meant to go for the uh, rail. We can see I have the jumper for the, mag uh, the LED data wire. And then we have a bunch of different things here. We have the LEDs for the battery charge indicator, which are uh, pretty useful to have through the diffuser. Um, it's not typically easy to tell. In another revision, I would have kind of put it on top and put its own uh, diffuser, but I didn't really think about that when designing it. But what's more interesting is if you see the instructable, uh, this section here does not exist. Uh, what this was was a Teensy 3.5, and originally I was going to have this as a wired uh, wireless duo and I was originally going to have the keyboard so you could plug it in, plug it into a PC and you'd be able to use it in the BIOS and stuff or you could have it completely wireless which is only usable in the OS. Uh, so right now this is only wireless but uh, originally I was going to use a TNC 3.5 but uh, what I ended up stopping doing that just because I wasn't really sure how to go about it. Um, I didn't really have the ability to communicate between the two. Uh, I could have done it with some hodgepodge, but I didn't really design it into the PCB. And when you power them both up, uh, they'll kind of fight over the um, control of the keyboard. I didn't really want that happening. I didn't want power flowing between them. So I ended up just not adding the TNC 3.5 and just left it to be wireless. Uh, we have a USB 3 port here too, which you may think is pretty cool. Um, I ended up removing that in the final design too because I couldn't ever get it working. I can only get the USB 2 speeds, uh, USB 3 is kind of finicky. So right now what I have this is a pass through power, it's not even connected to USB 2.0. So you can just um, pass through and charge something else, so if you have like AirPods or another microcontroller that just needs to be charged, uh, you can plug it into there. We can switch over to the back and you can see a bunch of the uh, design behind it. 
So we have these battery holders, which are basically the bulk of what uh, the weight is. And they basically screw into the PCB. So it's hard to see, but I have a little nut in there and a screw that goes through the PCB and the holder. And it holds it in place and I have one for each. And it actually works out pretty well for the design. Um, and then just the 18650 sitting there. And the daughter board for the charge indicator, uh, like I showed, we have the LEDs. There's a little notch in here, so it cuts out uh, so you can see through. And then the batteries are just connected there. The positive side has a uh, JST connector, which goes to the switch in the case, so you can hardware disconnect it. And then we've basically got the ESP32. I have a capacitor over here that I added later on. That's to let me unplug it without it... Um, disconnecting because every time I unplugged it, it would reboot the whole keyboard, which was kind of annoying. Uh, so this often stops that. It should really be a higher capacity because it's, it's not stopping it all the time. And then this is the little 3.3 volt regulator. Um, I would change that in the next one too. I don't think it's very efficient. And then basically 5 volts come from here. 3.3 volts go to the uh, regular or five volts go to the regulator which goes to 3.3 volts and then the ESP32 uh, goes with 3.3 volts because that's what it likes to play with we have the little programming wires here so these go outside of the case um, up at top here we have the ESP32 um, that's the boot pin or whatever if it gets pulled low during um, there we go if it gets low if pulled low during boot it will put the microcontroller in a boot sequence where you can program it uh, at the time, I didn't realize that was needed, so I forgot it, so I had to solder that on later. On the second revision, I actually updated that and put a button in place for it. And this is the little programmer jig, so what I mentioned with the USB 3, uh, it actually goes to this port here. And the USB 3 doesn't work on this either, but it's just USB 2, which lets me program from the USB-C port, actually. But uh, originally this was here, I remember this in the final design, uh, originally I was going to have a USB hub in here, so when you plugged it in uh, wired, it would go to that USB hub, one would go to the uh, TNC 3.5 and one would go to the out, uh, output here. I ended up stopping that, um, I couldn't get the USB 3.0 to work, didn't really know how to do the USB uh, 3.5 and the USB hub would only work when you actually plugged it in so I kind of stopped with that. Uh, you can see a couple of the errors I had. Uh, I misspelled sanctuary uh, <laughs> which is an awful mistake to do but uh, more importantly here I have a bunch of pull down resistors. Um, I think it's these four columns. I didn't realize needed pull down resistors because I thought the ESP32 had them internally. Uh, turns out the ESP32 only has them internally for some of them. Uh, so that's why these kind of heat shrink capped on tape ones are kind of jankily soldered here. And then just the rest of it is just your normal, uh, these are SK6812 mini E LEDs mounted on the underside. So those uh, are the RGB. Um, I know most of the time I have it set on cyan, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose of them. I think next build I'll just do cyan only. And then we have the diodes, I think they're 1N4 something uh, diodes, I can't remember the numbering. But uh, they basically prevent the ghosting. You can see a couple of the sockets are unused. I actually designed this to be a ISO compatible layout. And I also designed it for a non-standard bottom row, so I believe that's um, a 6.0 spacebar that I accounted for. Um, I guess I didn't do the stabilizer for that, which doesn't really help. But um, yeah, I basically designed it to have a different, or no, what I did was a 1U keycaps here, so you could have 5 instead of 4, I believe. And uh, what that would do, just let you have a couple more keys, um, but not everything was supported and I didn't really end up doing much with it. Uh, but yes, it is ISO compatible technically. Uh, if you actually go through that, I believe I have the diodes for that. Just the LEDs for those keys uh, may not be supported. Um, but basically, yeah, that's the sanctuary. You have the function row here under the LEDs. And the whole thing, uh, you have the JST connectors here, so you'd connect those in place. But the whole thing just kind of sits in the case nicely um, and it'll kind of sit nicely in its spot and then 
just screws in place with the heat uh, threaded inserts. So that's kind of the insight behind the sanctuary. Um, I don't know if anyone really finds that entertaining. I think it's kind of cool. But if you like this kind of stuff, um, subscribe to me on YouTube. Consider supporting with the Amazon affiliate link or whatever. And uh, leave any comments or questions you have. I, I'm the designer behind it, so I know it. If you have any questions, uh, leave them and I'll try to reply to them. Thanks for watching.